The Ghost in the Mill, a short story by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Come, Sam, tell us a story, said I as Harry and I crept to his knees in the glow of the bright evening firelight, while Aunt Lois was busily rattling the tea things, and Grandmama, at the other end of the fireplace, was quietly setting the heel of a blue-mixed yarn stocking. In those days, we had no magazines and daily papers, each reeling off a serial story. Once a week, the Columbian Sentinel came from Boston with its slender stock of news and editorial, but all the multiform devices, pictorial, narrative, and poetical, which keep the mind of the present generation ablaze with excitement, had not then even in existence. There was no theater, no opera. There were in Old Town no parties or balls, except, perhaps, the annual election or Thanksgiving festival. And when winter came and the sun went down at half-past four o'clock and left the long, dark hours of evening to be provided for, the necessity of amusement became urgent. Hence, in those days, chimney-corner storytelling became an art and an accomplishment. Society then was full of traditions and narratives, which had all the uncertain glow and shifting mystery of the firelit hearth upon them. They were told to sympathetic audiences by the rising and falling light of the solemn embers, with the hearth crickets filling up every pause. Then the aged told their stories to the young, tales of early life, tales of war and adventure, of forest days, of Indian captivities and escapes, of bears and wildcats and panthers, of rattlesnakes, of witches and wizards, and strange and wonderful dreams and appearances and providences. In those days of early Massachusetts, faith and credence were in the very air. Two-thirds of New England was then dark, unbroken forests, through whose tangled paths the mysterious winter wind groaned and shrieked and howled with weird noises and unaccountable clamors. Along the iron-bound shore, the stormful Atlantic raved and thundered and dashed its moaning waters, as if to deaden and deafen any voice that might tell of the settled life of the old civilized world, and shut us forever into the wilderness. A good storyteller in those days was always sure of a warm seat at the hearthstone and the delighted homage of children, and in all old town there was no better storyteller than Sam Lawson. Do, do, tell us a story, said Harry, pressing upon him, and opening very wide blue eyes, in which undoubting faith shone as in a mirror, and let it be something strange and different from common. Well, I know lots of strange things, said Sam, looking mysteriously into the fire. Why, I know things that E.F. I should tell. Why, people might say they want so, but then they is so for all that. Oh, do, do tell us. Why I should scare you to death, maybe, said Sam doubtingly. Oh, Pooh, no, you wouldn't, we both burst out at once. But Sam was possessed by a reticent spirit and loved dearly to be wooed and importuned. And do he only took up the great kitchen tongs and smote on the hickory forest stick when it flew apart in the middle and scattered a shower of clear, bright coals all over the hearth. Mercy on us, Sam Lawson, said Aunt Lois in an indignant voice, spinning round from her dishwashing. Don't you worry a grain, Miss Lois, said Sam composedly. I see that her stick was in a most in two, and I thought I'd just settle it. I'll sweep up the coals now, he added, vigorously applying a turkey wing to the purpose, as he knelt on the hearth his spare, lean figure glowing in the blaze of the firelight and getting quite flushed with exertion. There now, he said, when he had brushed over and under and between the fire irons and pursued the retreating ashes so far into the red, fiery citadel that his finger ends were burning and tingling. That ours done now as well as Hepsy herself could have done it. I allers sweeps up the hearth. I think it's part of the man's business when he makes the fire. But Hepsy's so used to seeing me a doin' on't that she don't see no kind of merit in. It's just as Parson Lothrop said in his sermon, folks allers overlook their common marcies. But come, Sam, that story, 
said Harry and I coaxingly, pressing upon him and pulling him down into his seat in the corner. Lordy massy, these air young'uns, said Sam. There's never no content in on em. You tell em one story, and they just swallows it as a dog does a gob of meat, and they're all ready for another. What do you want to hear now? Now the fact was that Sam's stories had been told us so often that they were all arranged and ticketed in our minds. We knew every word in them and could set him right if he varied a hair from the usual track, and still the interest in them was unabated. Still we shivered and clung to his knee at the mysterious parts, and felt gentle cold chills run down our spines at appropriate places. We were always in the most receptive and sympathetic condition. Tonight, in particular, was one of those thundering stormy ones, when the winds appeared to be holding a perfect mad carnival over my grandfather's house. They yelled and squealed round the corners. They collected in troops, and came tumbling and roaring down chimney. They shook and tattled the buttery door, and the sink room door, and the cellar door, and the chamber door, with a constant undertone of squeak and clatter, as if at every door were a cold, discontented spirit, tired of the chill outside, and longing for the warmth and comfort within. "'Well, boys,' said Sam confidentially, "'what'll you have?' "'Tell us, come down, come down.' We both shouted with one voice. This was, in our mind, and a no one among Sam's stories. "'You mustn't be frightened now,' said Sam paternally. "'Oh, no, we aren't frightened ever.' said we both in one breath. Not when you go down the cellar arter cider, said Sam with severe scrutiny. Ev ye should be down cellar and the candle should go out now. I ain't, said I. I ain't afraid of anything. I never knew what it was to be afraid in my life. Well then, said Sam, I'll tell you. This ear's what Captain Eb Sawin told me when I was a boy about your bigness, I reckon. Captain Eb Sawin was a most respectable man. Your grandmother knew him very well, and he was a deacon in the church in Dedham before he died. He was at Lexington when the fuss gun was fired agin the British. He was a dreadful smart man, Captain Eb was, and driv team a good many years atween here and Boston. He married Lois Peabody, that was cousin to your grandmother then. Lois was a rail sensible woman and I've heard her tell the story as he told her, and it was just as he told it to me, just exactly, and I shall never forget it if I live to be nine hundred years old, like Methuselah. You see, along back in them times, there used to be a fellow come round these ear parts, spring and fall, a peddling goods, with his pack on his back, and his name was Jehiel Lomadieu. Nobody rightly knew where he come from, he wasn't much of a talker, but the women rather liked him and kind of liked to have him round. Women will like some fellows when men can't see no sort of reason why they should, and they liked this air Lama de, though he was kind of mournful and thin and shad-bellied, and hadn't nothing to say for himself. But it got to be so that the women would count and calculate so many weeks afore twas time for Lama de to be along and they'd make up ginger snaps and preserves and pies, and make him stay to tea at the houses, and feed him up on the best there was. And the story went round that he was a courtin' Phoebe Ann Parker, or Phoebe Ann was a courtin' him. Folks didn't rightly know which. Well, all of a sudden, La Madieu stopped coming round, and nobody knew why, only just he didn't come. It turned out that Phoebe Ann Parker had got a letter from him, saying he'd be along afore Thanksgiving. But he didn't come, neither afore nor at Thanksgiving time, nor arter, nor next spring, and finally the women they get up looking for him. Some said he was dead, some said he was gone to Canada, and some said he had gone over to the old country. Well, as to Phoebe Ann, she acted like a gal of sense, and married Bajah Moss, and thought no more about it, she took the right view on it, and said she was sartin that all things was ordered out for the best, and it was just as well folks couldn't always have their own way. And so in time La Madieu was gone out of folks' minds, much as a last year's apple blossom. 
It's really affecting to think how little these ear folks is missed that's so much sought by. There ain't nobody if they's ever so important. But what the world gets to going on without them, pretty much as it did with them, though there's some little flurry at first. Well, the last thing that was in anybody's mind was that they ever should hear from Lama Jew again. But there ain't nothing but what has its time a-turning up. And it seems his turn was to come. Well, you see, t'was the 19th of March when Captain Eb Sawin started with a team for Boston. That day, there come on about the biggest snowstorm that there had been in them parts since the oldest man could remember. T'was this here fine sifting snow that drives in your face like needles, with a wind to cut your nose off. It made teaming pretty tedious work. Captain Ebb was about the toughest man in them parts. He'd spent days in the woods a logging, and he'd been up to the district a Maine a lumbering, and was about up to any sort of thing a man generally could be up to. But these here March winds sometimes does set on a fellow so that neither nature nor grace can stand him. The captain used to say he could stand any wind that blew one way at time for five minutes, but come to winds that blew all four pints at the same minute. Why, they flustered him. Well, that was the sort of weather it was all day, and by sundown Captain Ebb he got clean bewildered, so that he lost his road, and when night came on he didn't know nothing where he was. You see, the country was all under drift, and the air so thick with snow that he couldn't see a foot afore him. And the fact was, he got off the Boston Road without knowing it, and came out at a pair of bars nigh upon Sherburne, where old Cack Sparrow's mill is. Your grandther used to know old Cack, boys. He was a dreadful drinking old critter that lived there all alone in the woods by himself. A tendon saw and grist mill. He wasn't allers just what he was then. Time was that Cack was a pretty considerably likely young man and his wife was a very respectable woman, Deacon Amos Peitingall's dater from Sherburne. But you see, the year arter his wife died, Khaki gin up going to meetin' Sundays, and all the tithing men and select men could do, they couldn't get him out to meetin'. And when a man neglects means of grace and sanctuary privileges, there ain't no saying what he'll do next. Why, boys, just think on an immortal critter lying round loose all day Sunday and not putting on so much as a clean shirt, when all spectable folks has on their best clothes, and is to meet and worship in the Lord. What can you spec to come of it, when he lies idling round in his old weekday clothes, fishing or some sitch? But what the devil should be arter him at last, as he was arter old Keck? Here Sam winked impressively to my grandfather in the opposite corner, to call his attention to the moral which he was interweaving with his narrative. Well, you see, Captain Ebb, he told me, that when he come to them bars and looked up, and saw the dark a-coming down, and the storm a-thickening up, he felt that things was getting pretty considerable serious. There was a dark piece of woods on ahead of him inside the bars, and he knew, come to get in there, the light would give out clean. So he just thought he'd take the hoss out of the team and go ahead a little and see where he was. So he drive his oxen up again the fence, and took out the hoss, and got on him, and pushed along through the woods, not rightly knowing where he was going. Well, afore long he see a light through the trees, and sure enough he come out to Cack Sparrow's old mill. It was a pretty considerable gloomy sort of a place that our old mill was. There was a great fall of water that come rushing down the rocks, and fell in a deep pool, and it sounded sort of wild and lonesome. But Captain Ebb, he knocked on the door with his whip handle and got in. Oh, there, to be sure, sought old Cack beside a great blazing fire, with his rum jug at his elbow. He was a dreadful fellow to drink, Cack was. For all that, there was some good in him, for he was pleasant-spoken and blagging, and he made the captain welcome. You see, Cack, said Captain Ebb, I'm off my road and got snowed up down by your bars, says he. Want or no, says Cack. Calculate you'll just have to camp down here till morning, says he. Well, so old Cack, he got out his tin lantern and went with Captain Ebb back to the bars to help him fetch along his critters. 
He told him he could put him under the mill shed. So they got the critters up to the shed and got the cart under. And by that time, the storm was awful. But Cack, he made a great roaring fire, cause you see, Cack Allers had slab wood aplenty from his mill. And a roaring fire is just so much company. It sort of keeps a fellow's spirits up, a good fire does. So Cack, he sought on his old tea kettle and made a swingin' lot of toddy. And he and Captain Ebb were having a tollable, comfortable time there. Cack was a pretty good hand to tell stories. And Captain Ebb weren't no way backward in that line and kept up his end pretty well. And pretty soon they was a roaring and haw hawing inside about as loud as the storm outside. When all of a sudden, about midnight, there come a loud rap on the door. Lordy Massey, what's that? says Cack. Folks is rather startled owlers to be checked up sudden when they are a carrying on and laughing. And it was such an awful blowy night, it was a little scary to have a rap on the door. Well, they waited a minute and didn't hear nothing but the wind a screeching round the chimbley, and old Cack was just going on with his story, when the rap come again, harder than ever, as if it had shook the door open. Well, says old Cack, if tis the devil, we just as goods open and have it out with him to onst, says he. And so he got up and opened the door, and sure enough, there was old Ketchery there. Expect you've heard your grandma tell about old Ketchery. She used to come to meetings sometimes, and her husband was one of the praying Indians. But Ketchery was one of the rail wild sort, and you couldn't no more convert her than you could convert a wildcat or a painter panther. Lordy Massey, Ketchery used to come to meeting and sit there on them Indian benches. And when the second bell was a tolling, and when Parson Lothrop and his wife was coming up the broad aisle, and everybody in the house rest up and stood, Ketchery would sit there and look at him out of the corner of her eyes. And folks used to say she rattled them necklaces of rattlesnakes tails and wildcat teeth, and sitch like heathen trumpery, and looked for all the world as if the spirit of the old sarpent himself was in her. I've seen her sit and look at Lady Lothrop out of the corner of her eyes, and her old brown baggy neck would kind of twist and work, and her eyes they looked so that t'was enough to scare a body. For all the world she looked just as if she was a-working up to spring at her. Lady Lothrop was just as kind to Catchery as she always was to every poor critter. She'd bow and smile as gracious to her when meetin' was over, and she'd come down the aisle passin' out a meetin'. But Catchery never took no notice. You see, Ketchery's father was one of them great powwows down to Martha's Vineyard, and people used to say she was set apart when she was a child, to the service of the devil. Anyway, she never could be made nothing of him in a Christian way. She come down to Parson Lothrop's study once or twice to be catechized, but he couldn't get a word out of her, and she kind of seemed to sit scornful while he was a-talkin'. Folks said if it was in old times, Ketchery wouldn't have been allowed to go on so, but Parson Lothrop's so sort of mild, he let her take pretty much her own way. Everybody thought that Ketchery was a witch. At least she knew considerable more than she ought to know, and so they was kind of afraid on her. Captain Ebb says he never see a fellow seem scareder than Cack did when he see Kachuria standing there. Why, you see, boys, she was as withered and wrinkled and brown as an old frosted pumpkin vine, and her little snaky eyes sparkled and snapped, and it made your head kind of dizzy to look at them. And folks used to say that anybody that Kachuri got mad at was sure to get the worst of it fussed or last. And so no matter what day or hour Kachuri had a mind to rap at anybody's door, folks generally thought it was best to let her in. But then they never thought her coming was for any good, for she was just like the wind. She came when the fit was on her, she stayed just so long as it pleased her, and went when she got ready, and not before. Ketchery understood English, and could talk it well enough, but always seemed to scorn it, and was a lair's mo win and muttering to herself in Indian, and winking and blinking as if she saw more folks round than you did, so that she want no way pleasant company, and yet everybody took good care to be polite to her. So old Cack asked her to come in, and didn't make no question where she come from, or what she come on. 
but he knew it was twelve good miles from where she lived to his hut, and the snow was drifted above her middle, and Captain Ebb declared that there weren't no track nor sign of a track of anybody's coming through that snow next morning. "'How did she get there, then?' said I. "'Didn't you never see brown leaves a-riding on the wind? "'Well, Captain Ebby says, she came on the wind, "'and I'm sure it was strong enough to fetch her. "'But Khaki got her down into the warm corner, "'and he poured her out a mug, a hot toddy. "'And gave her, but you see her being there sort of stopped the conversation, "'for she sat there a-rockin' backwards and forwards, "'a-sippin' her toddy, and a-mutterin', and lookin' up chimbly. Captain Ebb says in all his born days he never heard such screeches and yells as the wind give over that chimbley. An old cat got so frightened you could fairly hear his teeth chatter. But Captain Ebb, he was a putty brave man, and he won't go to have conversation stopped by no woman, witch or no witch. And so when he see her muttering and looking up chimbley, he spoke up and says he, Well, Katuri, what do you see? says he. Come out with it. Don't keep it to yourself. You see, Captain Ebb was a hearty fellow, and then he was a leetle warmed up with a toddy. Then he said he see an evil kind of smile on Katuri's face, and she rattled her necklace of bones and snakes' tails, and her eyes seemed to snap, and she looked up the chimbley and called out, Come down, come down, let's see who you be. Then there was a scratching and a rumbling and a groan, and a pair of feet come down the chimbley and stood right in the middle of the hearth, the toes panting outwards, with shoes and silver buckles a-shining in the firelight. Captain Ebb says he never come so near being scared in his life, and as to old Cack, he just wilted right down in his chair. <laughs> then old Ketchery got up and reached her stick up chimbley and called out louder, Come down, come down, let's see who you be. And sure enough, down came a pair of legs, and jined right onto the feet. Good fair legs they was, with ribbed stockings and leather breeches. Well, we're in for it now, says Captain Ebb. Go at Ketchery, and let's have the rest on him. Ketchery didn't seem to mind him. She stood there as stiff as a stake, and kept calling out, Come down, come down, let's see who you be and then come down the body of a man with a brown coat and yellow vest, and jined right onto the legs. But there weren't no arms to it. Then Ketchery shook her stick up chimbley and called, Come down, come down. And there came down a pair of arms, and went on each side of the body, and there stood a man all finished, only there weren't no head on him. Well, Ketchery, says Captain Ebb, this ear's getting serious. I speck you must finish him up, and let's see what he wants of us. Then Ketchery called out once more, louder than ever, Come down, come down, let's see who you be. And sure enough, down comes a man's head, and settled on the shoulders straight enough. And Captain Ebb, the minute he saw eyes on him, knew he was Jahiel Lomadieu. Old Cack knew him too, and he fell flat on his face, and prayed the Lord to have mercy on his soul. But Captain Ebb, he was for getting to the bottom of matters, and not have his scare for nothing. So he says to him, What do you want, now you have come? The man he didn't speak. He only sort of moaned, and pinted to the chimbley. He seemed to try to speak, but couldn't. For you see, it isn't often that his sort of folks is permitted to speak. But just then there came a screeching blast of wind, and blowed the door open, and blowed the smoke and fire all out into the room, and there seemed to be a whirlwind and darkness and moans and screeches. And when it all cleared up, Ketchery and the man was both gone, and only old Cack lay on the ground rolling and moaning as if he'd die. While Captain Ebb, he picked him up and built up the fire, and sort of comforted him up, cause the critter was in distress of mind that was dreadful. The awful providence, you see, had awakened him, and his sin had been set home to his soul, and he was under such conviction that it all had to come out. How old Cack's father had murdered poor Lamajou for his money, and Cack had been privy to it, and helped his father build the body up in that very chimbley, and he said that he hadn't had neither peace nor rest since then, 
and that was what had drive him away from ordinances. For you know sinning will always make a man leave praying. Well, Cack didn't live but a day or two. Captain Ebb, he got the minister of Sherburne and one of the select men down to see him, and they took his deposition. He seemed really quite penitent, and Parson Carroll, he prayed with him, and was faithful in setting home the providence to his soul. And so at the eleventh hour, poor old Cack might have got in. At least it looks a little like it. He was distressed to think he couldn't live to be hung. He sort of seemed to think that if he was fairly tried and hung, it would make it all square. He made Parson Carroll promise to have the old mill pulled down and bury the body, and after he was dead, they did it. Captain Ebb, he was one of a party of eight that pulled down the chimbley, and there, sure enough, was the skeleton of poor Lama Jew. So there you see, boys, there can't be no iniquity so hid but what it'll come out. The wild Indians of the forest and the stormy winds and tempests jined together to bring out this air. For my part, said Aunt Lois sharply, I never believed that story. Why, Lois, said my grandmother, Captain Ebb Sawin was a regular church member and a most respectable man. Law, mother, I don't doubt he thought so. I suppose he and Cat got drinking toddy together till he got asleep and dreamed it. I wouldn't believe such a thing if it did happen right before my face and eyes. I should only think I was crazy, that's all. Come, Lois, if I was you, I wouldn't talk so like a Sadducee, said my grandmother. What would become of all the accounts in Dr. Cotton Mather's Magnilly if folks were like you? Well, said Sam Lawson, drooping contemplatively over the coals and gazing into the fire, there's a putty considerable sight of things in this world that's true, and then again there's a sight of things that ain't true. Now my old grandther used to say, Boys, says he, if you want to lead a pleasant and prosperous life, you must contrive allers to keep just the happy medium between truth and falsehood. Now that are's my doctrine. Aunt Lois knit severely. Boys, said Sam, don't you want to go down with me and get a mug of cider? Of course we did, and took down a basket to bring up some apples to roast. Boys, says Sam mysteriously while he was drawing the cider, you just ask your Aunt Lois to tell you what she knows about Ruth Sullivan? Why, what is it? Oh, you must ask her. These ere folks that's so kind of topping about spirits and sitch, come sift them down. You gently find they knows one story that kind of puzzles them. Now you mind, and just ask your Aunt Lois about Ruth Sullivan. 